Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to look at uh, macroeconomic um, limitations of demand side policy when confronted with cost push inflation. Um, the classic example, and I've used this several times on the on the YouTube channel, but the classic example of cost push inflation or a supply shock is the 1973 oil crisis. Um, here we had OPEC nations, Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, intentionally reducing the global supply of oil uh, to retaliate against U.S. Uh, support for Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Um, this had a global uh, impact uh, since uh, every developing developed nation is dependent on gasoline as a key input in the modern economy, that supply shock reverberated throughout the global economy. And the price of oil, we can see uh, pretty much almost three, six, nine, twelve, almost quadrupled from about $3 per barrel to about $12 per barrel. Uh, here we say that was about a 300% increase in, uh, in the price. Um, again, we can see in this chart, the price of oil going up in 1973 because of that uh, oil shock, and then rising again in 1979, uh, I believe as a result of the Iran-Iraq war, and then the price of oil collapses. Um, so how does that uh, impact inflation? All right, well, supply shocks, cost push inflation, increases inflation. So we can see that in 1972, Inflation was at about 3.3%, and then it jumps to 6% in 1973, and then it jumps to 11% in 1974. So that's the impact of that cost push inflation that reduced aggregate supply. 1975, it goes to 9, 5%, 6%, 7%. 1979, that's the Iran-Iraq war, another supply shock, 11% inflation. 1980, 13% inflation. 1981, 10% inflation. That is a very, very high rate of inflation when the target rate of inflation is usually about 2%. And then we can see that from 1981 onward, the rate of inflation starts to fall, 10%, 6%, 3%, 4%, 3%, and down to the target rate, 1.9% in 1986. Now, this is the time in which Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, and he was implementing what was known as Reaganomics, which were market-based supply side policies as a solution. So we will also graph that solution. But first let's take a look at the initial limitations of demand side policies when faced with cost push inflation. And again, this is a, would be a part of your evaluation of demand side policies, highlighting the limitations of demand side policies when faced with cost push inflation. So here we have our monetarist model. We're at the natural rate at point A, 81 equals SRS1 equals LRS with a price level at PL1 y, uh, with real GDP at YP. Perhaps this is 1971 or 1972 in the United States. And then OPEC decides to reduce the supply of oil uh, worldwide. That causes a supply shock. So SRS shifts in from SRS1 to SRS2. We will illustrate that right here. Here is SRAS2, so we're illustrating cost push inflation. We see the rise in the price level from PL1 to PL2, and we see the economy going into recession. All right, so we see cost push inflation, and we see real GDP falling from YP to Y recession, and I'll call that Y recession one. So that is a typical. Uh, graph that we use to illustrate cost push inflation. There's other videos on this YouTube channel where I've illustrated and analyzed this. So we've seen this before. Okay, so real GDP falls from YP to Y recession. Quantity of output has decreased. The price level is rising, rising inflation in the economy, and we see that the quantity of aggregate demand is decreasing along AD from point A to point B. And that will cause firms to uh, fire labor because there's a, re a reduction in the quantity of aggregate demand. So unemployment 
is rising with inflation and is rising. So that's typically what we, we see with cost push inflation. Just a quick note, cost push inflation has the two economic evils of both rising inflation and rising unemployment. So inflation is rising and the unemployment rate, cyclical unemployment is beginning to appear. Unemployment is rising and real GDP is decreasing, right? Pretty much an economic nightmare for gov uh, economists working for the central government and the central bank. So what's the solution? Well, there's no easy out here with demand side policies. Demand side policies can either have aggregate demand increase to reduce unemployment and increase real GDP, but we will end up with more inflation or have AD shift in to reduce inflation, but we just get more unemployment. So let's go ahead and illustrate um, the potential solutions to solve this. Now in the 1970s, Keynesian economists or the Keynesian ideology was the dominant ideology. And um, Richard Nixon was president at that point in the 1970s, and he was using Keynesian economic policy to solve this problem. Um, so if the government was to engage in expansionary fiscal policy, increased government spending, right? we know that AD equals consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus exports minus imports. Um, so to solve this, we have the central government engaging in expansionary fiscal policy. So government spending is rising, and that causes AD to shift out. So in theory, let's have it shift out to this point. All right, this is expansionary fiscal policy. It could be expansionary monetary policy, um, but we're going to use expansionary fiscal increased government spending. So 81 shifts out to 82. We end up at a new equilibrium at point C, which we see here. And this increase in aggregate demand has solved the problem of unemployment. It has been able to bring unemployment back down. It's been able to increase real GDP. Real GDP has increased, unemployment's falling. But we end up with more inflation in the economy. So inflation goes from PL1 PL2 to PL3, okay? So that's not um, a great solution. So with cost push inflation, if we were to utilize expansionary fiscal or monetary policy, but we're just gonna use fiscal, we have um, unemployment falling. We have real GDP increasing due to the increased aggregate demand of government spending, but we get inflation rising. So there's a trade-off there. With expansionary fiscal policy, you can reduce unemployment, but you will get more inflation. Okay? How about contractionary monetary policy? Let's illustrate contractionary monetary policy. Let's use uh, this color. So if we were to use contractionary, where perhaps the government is decreasing spending, uh, perhaps it is raising taxes, or perhaps the central bank is engaging in contractionary monetary policy, we'll use that as an example, contractionary monetary policy, that would push AD back from 81 to 83 in this case. Let's go ahead and label that. And we're able to reduce inflation. Inflation falls from PL2 to PL1, but we get a rise in unemployment. So we're at this new equilibrium at point D. And we go deeper into the recession. So we go from Y recession one to Y recession two. Okay, so going deeper into 
the recession. So with contractionary, we're going to use the example of contractionary, let's say monetary policy is a demand side policy, contractionary monetary policy, we can uh, reduce inflation. Inflation can be brought down, as we see here, but unemployment goes up. Unemployment rises and real GDP decreases. So there's a trade-off. If you want to tackle inflation, you're going to end up with more unemployment. So demand-side policies are really limited in their ability to address cost-push inflation. Either you use expansionary monet, uh, fiscal policy or some type of expansionary demand-side policy to reduce unemployment, but you get more inflation or you use contractionary demand side policies to reduce inflation, but you go deeper into the recession. So there is no easy solution here. Okay, uh, I will create another video to highlight uh, Reaganomics, how Ron Reagan tackled the issue of cost push inflation. But for now, let's go ahead and analyze this to highlight the limitations of demand side policies in regards to addressing cost push inflation. Okay. So as we would on a paper one or two or three uh, exam, uh, as can be seen here, we have an economic model, graph A representing the US national economy in the 1970s. We're measuring real GDP on the X axis and the price level on the Y axis. We have a perfectly inelastic longer aggregate supply curve, which highlights the uh, maximum quantity of outputs that can be produced when all inputs are employed. We have, let's just start with a downward sloping aggregate demand curve labeled AD1, downward sloping according to the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the international trade effect. And we have an upward sloping SRES curve um, labeled SRES1. Upward sloping because as the price level rises, firms are incentivized to increase output uh, because their profits are rising. So where SRES1 equals AD1, which is equal to LRS1 at point A, it sets an equilibrium price level at PL1 and an equilibrium level of real GDP at YP, we're at full employment or the natural rate of unemployment. Then in 1973, uh, OPEC engages in um, reduced global supply of oil that leads to a supply shock, which causes SRS1 to shift in to SRS2 establishing a new equilibrium at point B, which is where SRS2 equals AD1. And we see that the price level rises from PL1 to PL2. So there's cost push inflation in the economy. And we also see that uh, we have fallen into a recession from YP to Y recession one, real GDP has decreased. The quantity of aggregate demand is decreasing from point A to point B. Firms begin to fire excess labor and unemployment begins to rise in the economy. So at point B, what are the solutions if we were to apply demand side policies? One is to engage in expansionary demand side policies, some type of expansionary demand side, which we see here. We're gonna use the example of expansionary fiscal policy. So the government's gonna engage in increased government spending. So that causes 81 to shift out to 82. That sets a new equilibrium at point C, where 82 equals SRS1. It sets a new equilibrium price level at PL3. So we have continued rise in the price level. This is due to demand pull inflation. But because of the increased aggregate demand from the increased government spending and the Keynesian multiplier effect, we see that the quantity of aggregate supply begins to increase to meet the increased aggregate demand. So firms begin to hire more resources like labor. So unemployment begins to fall, output begins to increase, and we go from Y recession one to Y P. So the trade-off is that we are able to successfully lower unemployment and increase real GDP at the trade-off of rising inflation, or in this case, demand pull inflation on top of cost push inflation, all right? So not an ideal solution.
How about contractionary demand side policies? We will use the example of contractionary monetary policy. So perhaps the central bank begins to reduce the supply of money to raise interest rates. That will have the effect of uh, reducing consumption spending and investment spending. Money is more expensive to borrow, so households and firms will borrow and spend less. AD will shift in from 81 to 83, setting a nuclear room at point D, where 83 equals SRS2. Uh, that policy reduces the cost push inflation. Inflation falls from PL2 to PL1, but real GDP decreases further from Y recession one to Y recession two. And as a result of the fall in AD, the quantity of aggregate supply begins to decrease. So firms begin to fire excess resources like labor. So unemployment begins to rise. So contractionary monetary policy tackles inflation. Inflation falls at the expense of rising unemployment and falling real GDP. Okay, so that is one a uh, key evaluation point of demand side policy is that it's not able to successfully address cost push inflation. So in the next video, I will discuss Reaganomics and how Ronald Reagan and his administration tackled the cost push inflation that they were experiencing through supply side market-based policies and also contractionary demand side policies. And that's it. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. All the best.